up on my clock. Are you all ready to get started? Do it. Sure. All right, here we go. Welcome to the smartest people in the room. We are so glad you are here with us, and just by showing up today, you are already demonstrating your very own smarts. <laughs> today, we are pleased to deliver a program featuring two stars from the world of live streaming, as well as heroes of mine from the jam band world. <laughs> and I promise you will leave today smarter and more inspired than you arrived. More on that in a moment. Before we get started, let me take care of some business. First, to the audience, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat window. The reason we do these webinars is twofold. First, we want to showcase really smart people and the amazing work they do day to day in the music industry. But the second reason is a bit more nuanced. Many of you know that I am a music industry headhunter. I place music executives in roles throughout the industry. So by definition and function, I help people connect with companies. In this series, my goal is to help you make more connections, and I invite you to take full advantage of that opportunity. Specifically, I invite you to engage with the speakers and the other attendees in the chat of the Zoom. Please introduce yourselves, share your LinkedIn profile, say hello to your friends, and make some new ones. And ask questions of our speakers. We will try to address as many of those along the way during the interview. And also, please make sure your chat is set to address speakers and attendees. I want to thank our sponsors for without their support, we could not keep this free. Thank you to First Horizon Bank, Bufkin Baker, Four Roses Bourbon, the Tennessee Entertainment Commission, Lightning 100, Tennessee Brew Works, Moo TV, Jive Printing, Project Music, and Cushmaster's brand of CBD products. So let's get down to business. In today's host seat, we welcome back my good friend and alum of this platform, David Gans from Oakland, California. David is a musician, author, and radio host. In his own words, he says, the first thing I ever played on a guitar was a song my brother helped me write, and I've been writing and playing and doing music-related work ever since. In the ensuing 50 plus years, David has published five books, worked as a magazine editor for consumer and trade publications, and published a dozen albums of mostly original material. His interest in the Grateful Dead never interfered with his work as a music journalist, but it eventually led to his becoming something of a specialist on the topic. After his first book called Playing in the Band came out in 1985, he wandered into the radio business after an appearance on the KFOG Deadhead Hour led to his being invited to host the program. I never made a plan, he asserts. Other radio stations asked if they could carry the show. The band gave me their blessing, and 36 years later, I am still hosting and distributing the Grateful Dead Hour. In 2007, David was hired to help design the programming for Sirius Satellite Radio's Grateful Dead channel, and since January 2008, he has co-hosted the popular Sunday afternoon talk show, Tales from the Golden Road. After the pandemic made it impossible to play gigs, David started playing a live set every afternoon on Facebook and also on cashfortrade.org. And to date, he has performed nearly 450 consecutive shows. Incredible, David. So nice to have you back with us. Welcome. Well, I would say that was more than 450 almost consecutive shows. Um, <laughs> but who's counting? Well, I... I just decided I, I had to do something. If I waited till nobody else was playing, I would never have done a show. So I just decided to start playing every day and see what happened. And it wound up keeping me sane and connected and even pulling in a few bucks and I'm having a great time doing it. Well, awesome. Hang on one second. Let me, let me finish here and then I'm going to hand it over to you guys. Right on. And joining David as today's special guest is Brad Serling a Johnny Appleseed of online concert recordings, according to the New York Times. Yeah. Brad has been active in the digital media space for 20 years. Established artists ranging from Fish to Metallica to the Grateful Dead burn, turned to Brad for ad, advice on digital distribution of their content. Brad started Nugs.net in 1993 as a way to share the tapes he was making of Grateful Dead and Fish shows. With the artist's blessing, Nugs.net's non-commercial live music download site mushroomed to 3 million free downloads a month by 2000. Seeing the business potential he had tapped into, the Grateful Dead hired Brad as a consultant in mid-2000. The Dead put Fish in touch with Brad, and by 2002, Nugs.net went from fan site to paid download provider with the launch of LiveFish.com. 
Today, 115 million downloads later, hundreds of artists and labels partner directly with Nugs.net to distribute music directly to their fans. A tastemaker among fans, Brad hosts a show we every each week on Sirius XM's Jam On channel, the weekly live stash, showcasing the week's best live music. Additionally, he's a regular guest on Bruce Springsteen's E Street radio channel. In the fall of 2016, MTV tapped him to produce the Nugs.net live stash, airing Sunday nights at 9 o'clock on MTV Live. In the years between launching Nugs.net as a fan site and, and going pro, Brad served for three years as a founding chief technology officer for Cinema Now, the first company to deliver web-based video on-demand and pay-per-view services of Hollywood feature films. Prior to Cinema Now, Brad pioneered live web events for Woodstock 94, Metallica from the North Pole, the Grammy Awards, the NFL, and 11 World Series webcasts. Brad's experience has spanned all aspects of website development, live webcasting, multimedia content deployment, and large-scale media distribution. He served on the board of the Grateful Dead's Rex Foundation for over five years. He earned a BA in history from Cornell University. Please welcome these two rock stars to the smartest people in the room. David, please take it away. Who are you calling a rock star, man? Why am I seeing? Oh, there we go. Now I can see my subject. <laughs> Hi, everybody. So it's so nice to be here again. And it's great to be here with Brad. Um, we've collaborated off and on for uh, upwards of 20 years now. And it, for, it's been amazing to watch. This guy was swapping MP3s in the mid 90s. And now he's the king of the freaking streaming universe. How in the world did that happen? Uh, serendipity. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, uh, man. I mean, you know, if you could say that you were born to do something i i was clearly born to do this and this is you know this is my teenage dreams come true when i was 15 and would be setting up my tape deck to record the grateful dead hour so i could have you know the best sounding tapes in addition to whatever i was taping on my own i'd sing the band fast forward to now when um you really bring it full circle now david you and i are working together on the upcoming dead and company tour officially producing the live streams each night and david you and gary lambert will be hosting um the open to each show and the set break which we're calling dead air each night so it's really a full circle moment going from taping the dead uh when i would go to the shows to um you know recording the grateful dead hour swapping tapes putting the tapes on a website but the way it happened was you know it's pretty straightforward actually it was um in the 90s there were a lot of people putting their tapes online in a variety of ways, you know, and then by the time Napster blew up, of course, it turned the, the record industry upside down. But not every band was scared of that. A lot of bands wanted to embrace that. So interestingly for me, um, Nugs.net, the site first went up in 97, you know, back in the earlier 90s, I'm swapping tapes in a variety of different ways. But the actual domain went up in 97. And by 2000, I got a call from the lawyer that represented the Grateful Dead and Fish. Lucky for me, it was a one-stop shop. It was the same guy. Uh, he represented both bands, and he said, we either need to shut you down or go into business with you. So um, at the time, I it's just great started... that they gave you the option. I mean, a lot of people yeah. just shut down without... Well, that, that's what was really interesting. And, um, you know, thankfully, they had the foresight to see they being both the dead and fish saw the potential in what I was doing. And they, they saw it as a threat, but they also saw that I had tapped into something. And, you know, what I was really proud of is when Grateful Dead had actually hired me and brought me to meet the band for the first time, they introduced me as the one guy out there on the internet that was not ripping off the band. Because <laughs> what I was doing was purely just sharing tapes in a non-commercial way with the band's blessing, according to their taper policy, you know, even going back to 94, um when i graduated college i called up the grateful dead and said hey can i put my tapes on a website they said what's a website you know do whatever you want don't rip us off those were their exact words wow so you know that's what started me down this path of, of sharing the tapes online because i would come back from shows and i'd have so many tapes so many people wanted copies of the tapes it was really just a practical thing there were more people wanting copies of my tapes than there was time in the day to make those copies so i thought well can i 
first I put them on a Gopher site, then an FTP site, and then you know that evolved into what's now Nugs.net. Um, but it was with the band's blessing, but in a non-commercial way. So they saw the potential of the non-commercial distribution I was doing, and saw that I was legit in that I was, you know. I founded the company that did the first deal with the major studios to distribute their films. So clearly I had passed the muster of the CTOs of all of the movie studios. And having done that, I think there was a level of trust there that I wasn't just some jackass out there sharing my tapes. I was some jackass sharing my tapes who actually was doing it in a legitimate way without ripping them off. <laughs> but, but you, This required revisiting a gigantic issues of intellectual property rights. I mean, the whole free trading of things, the internet archive, I, I, I'm a person who creates material and tries to sell it. And right. here we are in a world where most of what you're doing is being given away and you have to figure out how to monetize it. And I mean, not only has the whole music industry gone turned upside down in the 20 years you've been doing this, but just the, the whole question of how to, to, uh, get those things paid for was you you had to basically invent that world kind of didn't you yeah we made it up as we went along certainly <laughs> um you know one of my greatest mentors was john paluska who was fish's original manager um, and now he, runs a restaurant in berkeley yeah he runs a wonderful uh come on fabulous <laughs> with a fabulous sound system yes <laughs> the, <laughs> the minor sound right. constellation system in the, in the ceiling um but Paluska was, uh, you know, very much a shoot from the hip kind of guy. And he always used to say he wasn't in the music business. He was in the fish business. But fish was so much at the forefront of, you know, bleeding edge of technology, much in the way that the Grateful Dead was before them. And as much as fish hates that comparison to the Grateful Dead, you know, clearly at most of the business, as fish's business evolved, it evolved in the footsteps of, of the path that the Grateful Dead had blazed before them. Everything from how to ticket the shows direct to fan to, you know, when they took the leap and built their own festivals. Um, you know, there was a lot of collaboration with former Grateful Dead people of how to do it right and handle crowd control and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, uh, but I would also posit that the Fish and the other bands that came along after the Grateful Dead had the benefit of learning from the mistakes the Grateful Dead made and how not to manage these things. Well, that's true too. Um, you know, certainly the Grateful Dead policy, taping policy back in the 80s wasn't so much a, um, a genius business move. It was more, we don't want to police our fans. So let's just set up a place for them to do it. You know, we got, it wasn't, we got vast credit for it, uh, exceeding to the reality that they couldn't control any other way. Right. And it's, you know, we joke about serendipity, but the Grateful Dead was successful in spite of themselves. I mean, there's just so many mistakes that they made over and over and over again and still to this day but uh it's you know at the end of the day the music is what drove the success you know you've got a collection of these songs that are timeless and even with all the flubs that would happen on stage it didn't matter that was part of the appeal and the the drive to collect the tapes the foresight that they really had that uh, at least to me that i've learned now working with all these other artists like a bruce springsteen or a metallica or Pearl Jam is the, the foresight that the Grateful Dead had to roll tape every night, which, you know, I think of their generation, probably Frank Zappa was the only other one doing it to maybe Jimmy, but you know, he died too soon, um, had the foresight to roll tape all the time. And that was really, and I, it's at least my understanding, that wasn't like a business decision. Oh, there's a future gold mine here. It was more, no, hey, we want to check the quality of the recording and see how the Owsley, Owsley was recording the shows as what he calls his sonic journals because he wanted to hear, you know, listen back to his mixes and see how they were doing. The band figured out that since they were playing differently every night, it would be a good idea to record and see if you know see what happened and they actually in the early days would get together in a hotel room and listen to their recordings after the show right. and, and listen to because when you're doing improvisational music you want to hear stuff back and go oh that's a cool little bit there maybe we can even tease that up into a song you know that kind of thing so they yeah. were reviewing their performances and bear was reviewing his uh mixes and they didn't realize at the time that they were creating a treasure trove that they would later be able to exploit at great profit or at least at reasonable profit 
down the line, modulo a few mistakes that were made along the way, like their archivist Dick Lotvala giving away vast amounts of the vault to friends. But that's another issue. Yeah, but I, I think they weren't thinking that that was a future retirement plan. It was just there was a practical reason why they were making the tapes. Right. Right. Um, but we as fans certainly benefited from that. And then that model that they created is what bands like Fish followed and recorded everything, which then did turn into a business. Um, you know, certainly for the Grateful Dead now, that, that's a primary business for them. It's these amazing releases that they do through Rhino, uh, deluxe box sets and, and all the other stuff. Um, carrying it forward again to today, like we were saying, you know, we have Dead and Company starting their tour on Monday, which is the ultimate manifestation of everything the Grateful Dead would have done had the technology allowed it back then. Every single night the band plays is a pay-per-view on Nugsnet. The audio is released immediately. So by the time the fans hit the parking lot, you can be listening to that night's show. If you attend yeah. the show, you can scan your ticket that was used for admission and it'll unlock a stream of the show. And we're doing everything that the Grateful Dead would have done had they been able to do it. And, you know, one quick anecdote, when, uh, you know, Fish had played a series of shows at the Bill Graham Civic Center over the years. And I remember one of the year, maybe it was the second year they were there, um, Dan Healy came by to check out what we were doing and we gave him you know the royal tour of what was happening backstage and how it was a pay-per-view and we were doing a live multi-track recording every night in a dressing room and you know he was just blown away and saying man if we could have done this you know he's like we tried like 1970 we had two stations broadcasting simultaneously so we could do a quadraphonic live broadcast two fm stations that you could tune into on two different receivers he's like but man that if we have done that a live was only a one two time experiment it was way impractical yeah. there was a moment in the early 90s when healy was was proposing that they might take a truck there was a company in petaluma called kaba that made rack mounted mass tape duplication systems yep i remember they, they had it at giants 91 the, the giants 91 at giants 91 they had the decks set up and they made a bunch of tapes but they didn't sell them that was just a pilot, I guess. They were trying to see yeah. if it would work. But he he had posited the idea of having a truck go around with the band. This actually got implemented some years later on Rat Dog Tour, the Rat Dog Live thing, where they would, you know, yep. they, they were burning CDs of the first set during the break and burning CDs right after the set, and you could go buy the thing. But in, 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 there was a moment in the early 90s when Healy was proposing the idea of maybe having a truck making mass quantities of fast high-speed duplicated cassettes that you could line up for after the show. It, I think that would probably have been a, an expensive failure had they actually tried to implement it. But along comes the internet, and now all of a sudden you can live stream everything. Now, that, that was a leap for you, though, up from distributing music after the fact to doing it live. When and, when and how did that come into uh, the picture? Um. Well, the quick story is we started out with doing the live recording and making it available right away. So we, we officially started New Year's Eve 2002 with Fish. I actually sat at the soundboard with a laptop and made a 24-bit a 96K stereo recording, which at the time was a little precarious trying to do that on a laptop. But we did that and we had you know ADAT backups just in case. But I did that recording and then went back to the hotel, edited it and posted it on live fish that night that was really the genesis of of what we were doing commercially um so that was audio only for the first couple of years then in 2010 fish was playing the greek in berkeley for three nights and they had they had a video crew out for the first time and it wasn't for screens because there are no screens at the greek and the band wasn't wearing screens um the sole purpose of having the video crew there was just for archival purposes to have ISOs and, and a line cut each night in case the band decided to do, do something down the road. So after a, a couple months of that, the band came to me and said, hey, well, tonight how a paper. Uh, long story short, 2002 is when we started selling the audio every night. 2010 is when we did our first live pay-per-view stream, which was again from the garden, um, New Year's 2010. So New Year's, 20, New Year's 2002, we started the audio release program at the garden. New Year's 2010, we did our first live pay-per-view stream. And then it, it grew from there. Um, now with this fish tour that's happening right now, it's the first time the band has agreed to pay-per-view every single night. Wow. So every night is a pay-per-view on this current tour and every night is a 4K pay-per-view, which was new as of this tour. 
You must have spent a shitload of money on hardware, man. <laughs> I mean, the, the story. Of, <laughs> how, this, how many full-blown touring video production facilities do you have? Well, thankfully, that's another company's responsibility. Oh, so good. <laughs> there's vendors that the band, which just like the band has a company who flies the PA, a company who flies the lights. There's a company that handles the video production. To be clear, that company is not Nugsnet. Nugsnet is the distribution partner, the marketing partner, the subscription provider, the paper, you know. So um, who controls that? So the band controls the, the video production and feeds you the, the signal to distribute? We do have house production capabilities, but I... So uh, I think my connection's breaking up. Yeah, we're losing you a little bit here. Uh oh, I'm sorry. Can you guys hear me? I broke up for a sec. We can hear you. Your picture's frozen in a funny play, but we can hear you talking. Oh, now we've lost them all together. What do we do, Tom? Oh, well. Hey, sorry about that. I had to unmute. Um, Brad, turn your video off just for a moment. See if that wakes up the audio. If not, David, you may be performing your Facebook Live show early today on a different platform. <laughs> well, while he gets his shit together. <laughs> yeah, let, let's actually talk about you for a minute while we get him reconnected. I, I do want to go back to what I said in my intro. You've performed live for nearly 450 days consecutively. Tell us about that. Oh, okay. It look, looks like Brad's reconnecting. Um, I got... Uh, uh, I was sitting there at home in March of 2020 watching my entire year of gigs dry up one at a time. And April 20 was going to be my biggest month. I had a two week tour and two festival bids and it was and it was just painful as hell watching those get canceled one one after the other and then the rest of the year just got rolled up and put back in the closet. And uh, I just I, I looked around, I saw that so and so was scheduling a show for this night and then they were going to do this and that. And, and I just thought if I wait for no till there's a moment when nobody else is, is doing anything, it's probably going to be at 2 a.m. sometime and nobody's going to watch. So I'm, I just decided I'm going to start playing every day and see what happens. And I, I picked a a time that was a non-prime time. I started doing it at four o'clock in the afternoon in California time. And largely with the help of a woman who's on in the chat here today called Jill Swellville. She just went to work promoting this and, and recruiting community members. And so I consider Jill basically the queen of the green room because all these people that came in, she would welcome them and, and built a community. And that group of people, there's a couple dozen of them that have been there literally almost every day. And that's been great. And for me to play every day, uh, I've kept track of the songs that I've played in, in a spreadsheet. And I have this kind of aging report so I don't accidentally play something more often than once every five or six days or so. And I've revisited every moment of my 50 plus year music career. I've been playing old Cat Stevens songs that I was doing in coffee houses in 1972 and improvising and playing all my favorite Grateful Dead songs. And of course, several dozen of my own originals and various other things. And it's just been great. Every day I play and every day there's a continuity to it that has been just absolutely great for my musicality. And I, I, aside from the fact that I'm not writing anything new, everything else is just really fresh and rolling out and it feels good. And we have Brad back, so let's resume that conversation. Where were we? Uh, I think we were talking about the video crew. Well, I wanted to, I just wanted to maybe change the subject then and talk about, you've got, I mean, you've got Bruce Springsteen uh, the, the Bruce Springsteen concert archive. How, that's like a big thing from a guy what, from an entirely different musical yeah. school, right? I, what, what's fascinating to me about Bruce, and we were talking about the foresight that Grateful Dead had to record everything. Bruce, the complete opposite. I mean, it is shocking to me the deeper we get into his vault of what is not there. I mean, not even front of house tapes, not even, you know, just straight up soundboards. There's like, the last 20 years he has everything 
but um the born to run tour there's not many tapes there and born in the usa which was the biggest tour of its day there was only you know a handful of shows that were multi-tracked and they don't even have the board tapes and it was just they just weren't thinking that way it wasn't something that bruce personally was interested in and it wasn't something that john landau was interested in and you know john and i will talk about this and and you know because i'm coming from grateful dead world and he's like, you got to understand, we were not like the Grateful Dead. We just wasn't wasn't something that we were thinking of. So it really makes me treasure the fact that the Grateful Dead recorded everything. And it's, uh, you know, th so that, that was a big learning curve for me, jumping into Bruce's world. But as a kid who grew up in Philly, Bruce was everywhere. I mean, Bruce was all over the airwaves. Um, you know, when, when Born in the USA came out, I was, what, 15 or whatever. You know, it was right around the time I started touring with the Dead. So, you know, I was always aware of Bruce, but... I never was the diehard fan, like so many of the, the fans that are supporting this live program that we do with Bruce. Um, certainly, I feel honored and blessed. And the, the trust that Bruce and Landau have put in me and Nugsnet to pull this off is, I mean, I, I honestly can't believe it, that we have carte blanche to the archives and exclusive distribution rights to live Bruce Springsteen recordings going back as far as they have them. Um, you know, the one we just put out last week was somewhat recent one from 2012. Before that, it was a Born in the USA show from 85. Um, you know, we've done Bruce solo gigs. We've done, you know, the Darkness tour from 78 was really the goldmine of just incredible performances. We and put out all those. those, were, those yeah. so, so some of those were like uh, radio archives, right? Like there was that Winterland show from 78. Yeah. But, so if, if they didn't record it, you got stuff from the stations that did? Well, no, here's the beauty of those is we've gone back to the multi-track recordings. So all the circulating bootlegs were the, you know, the compressed FM stereo mix. Right. We went back to the multi-tracks almost every time. I think the only time we didn't was that famous Agora show from 78, which happened to be our first big archive release for Bruce, the Agora 78 show, phenomenal concert. but. Um, that we used the stereo mix because I think there was some issue with getting the, our hands on the multi-tracks, which goes back to what I was saying about the dead versus Bruce. The Grateful Dead, of course, would have had the multi-tracks. They would have made it themselves or at least would have had a pristine two-track. With Bruce, nope, they only had whatever was. Uh, so in that case, that was the radio broadcast we put out. But the Winterland show, the other shows, we did go back and found the multi-tracks. There's some cases, like there's a there's a show from the main point in early 75 that we want to put out. It was a WMMR broadcast. Um, and some of it is in Bruce's archives, but there's a missing piece, um, which we did source from a fan. And I think there's some debate as to whether we're actually going to use it or not. It was just an example of like, not everything is there. <laughs> Amazing. And Pearl Jam? I mean, who else Pearl. you got? You've got a huge roster of artists that you have these kind of deep deals with, right? Yeah, the, mar the marquee names would be, of course, all the Grateful Dead related bands, including Dead and Company, tour starting next week, Fish, who we started the company with. Um, Metallica was our next big deal after Fish. Um, and the interesting thing about Metallica is when we went to Warner Brothers to get the okay to do Fish, because back in 2002, Fish was still signed to Electro, which is owned by Warner Brothers, which at the time was owned by AOL, which is an interesting twist. Of, yeah. um, so we had to ask the higher ups for permission to do a deal directly with Fish that wouldn't violate their Electro deal. Instead of saying yes or no, they say, can you build us a Nugsnet for Metallica? So that's how Metallica became a client, because it was Metallica's reaction to the whole Napster fiasco where you know famously they're in congress testifying against fans and the thing that metallica was upset about was not so much that fans were trading their music it was that there was unreleased material that they hadn't authorized that was being traded um so you know metallica came to us and said hey we want to give away every show well then that was fine until we looked at the economics and realized it actually cost something to do that so we launched live metallica which was a similar version it was like a mirror image of live fish. We had built livefish.com in 2002. We built livemetallica.com in 2004, which was pretty much the same thing, but for Metallica. Um, and now Metallica is, you know, arguably the largest band on Nugsnet subscription service. So all this has bubbled up into a subscription business that we launched in 2014 um, called nugs.net. And that includes all the artists we work with, Metallica, Fish, Bruce, Pearl Jam, Chili Peppers, um, 
now Jimmy Buffett um, and every jam band. I, I also want to interject, though, that your system is big enough to encompass tiny little guys like me. We have and David. I Gans. have some sponsors in your you thing. And, and, I mean, that's part of that's one of the reasons that I think it's successful is that it's available to all of us. And, and in fact, that leads to a question that I've wanted to, to, to bring up today. And that is that the entire music industry has inverted since we got involved in it years and years ago. And historically, the recording industry drove these things and people would tour to drive record sales. Right. Well, the Grateful Dead never, that, that never worked for the dead because they never sold a lot of records. They toured to make a living and made records for creative satisfaction and maybe to promote their touring or whatever. Now, the whole fucking business has come around to that because nobody's buying records. That's why, you know, bands are out touring and they're mixing up their tours and stuff to attract people to maybe go to more than one show and stuff. In yeah. along the way, the entire revenue model has also been inverted. And over time, what you're doing has become much more powerful than what the record business is doing. That puts you in a pretty cool spot, I would think. Um, it does. And I, you know, certainly the, the ice is melting a bit in terms of like going to the major labels used to be, a, you know, it was just like a glass ceiling where they were constantly saying no to everything that we were asking for. I mean, for years in the mid 2000s, we were doing uh, Lollapalooza and Austin City Limits and Bonnaroo. We were running these live programs for those festivals and just the doors slammed in our face every single time we would ask for the rights to distribute the audio of X, Y, or Z band. It finally got to the point that we were already working with the headliners, whether that was Metallica, Fish, Dead, Pearl Jam. So we said, fuck it, we'll just release the headliner sets and who cares about the side stage? And it was because of the no's we were getting from the labels. Now that's come around, but it's still, you know, it's we're, we're in a weird spot because we're, while we're huge in one sense, in a small, you know, it's like big fish in a small pond, we're still nothing compared to the YouTube's and Spotify's and Apple's of the world in terms of reach and distribution. So it's like a double-edged sword. We're creating value for fans and for the bands that want to support this, but it's not like a one-size-fits-all on what works for Fish and Pearl Jam is going to work for every band on Universal. It, it just, that's not the case because primarily most of those bands are not good live performers and they're playing to a hard drive. And, you know, that, that doesn't mean that it's not a good show, but the show, it's like Hamilton going on tour. Hamilton's the same every night. And, you know, even though we did Roger Daltrey performing Tommy every night and Tommy doesn't change every night, there's a certain number of fans at any given show want the recording of that show. It's yeah. different from a band like Fish that can play 13 nights at the Garden and not repeat a song, which yeah. made Metallica's head explode. <laughs> With the, you know, it's another story I love to tell as I went, Fish did the, the Baker's Dozen, those 13 nights at the Garden, didn't repeat a song. A week later, I was in Edmonton with Metallica doing a free live stream of their show. And we, at that time, we were also doing the tuning room each night, which is where the band rehearses before the show. We were broadcasting that live for free as like a, a promo for live Metallica um, and just something cool that the band wanted to do. So we're, we're sitting there in the rehearsal space with the four band members kind of fucking around. And they did like this little jam for a minute. And Kirk joked, hey, we sounded like fish for a minute there. And then <laughs> then James said, did you hear what fish just did that they just played? 13 nights at MSG and didn't repeat a song and Lars and James looked at each other like uh, that would that would fucking kill me there's no way we can do that you know first of all because Metallica if they didn't play Enter Sandman and didn't play you know for whom the bell tolls people would literally riot and there would be bloodshed so it's a it's a different thing kind of like if Bruce didn't play Dance in the Dark or or Born in the USA you know uh, that's another Eagles didn't play Hotel California you know <laughs> Right. Well, okay. You brought up the Eagles. That's that's a really good case in point. I mean, we come from a culture that expects novelty and is conditioned to demand novelty, actually. And the Grateful Dead cultivated an audience that welcomed new songs instead of being hostile to them. Because right. we wanted that new thing. And the last thing we were interested in was hearing a perfect rendition of a song exactly as it was on the album. Right. But to, to, uh, I, I wanted to ask you a different question. When we first met in the late 90s, it was a time in the music world when nobody was 
expecting to have to pay for music. Everything was all being traded. The whole MP3s are killing the industry, all that stuff. And we that we seem to have pulled back from that culture, and now people are willing to pay for music again. I mean, I remember there was a long period when we were yeah. trying to educate people, saying, look, you're going to trade the tapes. Like when they first started, the, I, when I started doing the Grateful Dead Hour back in the day, I went to the band and said, why don't, you know, you should, guys should be selling this stuff. I should be able to say at the end of the show, if you like this, you could buy a copy of it. Well, they weren't ready to do that till some years later when the Dick's right. Picks and everything started. But there was a moment when our culture was expecting music to be free. Now, how did we pull back from that and get into a thing where people are willing to pay again? Thank well, you. I think it's convenience. Um, certainly people thought I was crazy when in 2002 we said, uh, you know, Fish is playing the garden and you can pay 10 bucks and get the recording the next day. People were like, well, why would I pay for it? And we didn't stop people from taping. There's still a taper section, but the best post i remember seeing on a on a message board and this was remember pre-facebook pre-social media everything but there were message boards um somebody said is anyone else going to feel like an asshole bringing their mics into the garden tonight you know like what's the point why am i bringing in my gear when i can get an official soundboard recording mixed and mastered by the band for 10 bucks i mean it's a very reasonable price so i think convenience is the answer and spotify proved that out at a mass scale the fact that you can pay $10 a month and get unfettered access to the entire recorded works of mankind. It's hard to beat, you know, just like, I mean, look at Netflix and the video side and, you know, you can still bootleg all you want. There's, there's tons of places where you can get, I mean, every, every note that we release from every band is being widely bootlegged and, you know, it's like whack-a-mole. What can I do to stop that? Certainly we, we take commercially reasonable measures to prevent that. But if you don't want to pay Nugsnet, if you don't want to pay a monthly subscription, if you don't want to pay a la carte, if you don't want to pay, Fish is taking the stage tonight at Hershey Park. It's a $25 pay-per-view. But if you don't want to pay it, there's plenty of people who will be bootlegging that stream despite our best efforts to prevent that. So, and, and a related question from Norwood Creech. What is the Nugs perspective of the live streaming of shows on Mixler? Is that how you say that? Although there's no video, uh, yeah, I've seen yeah. upwards of 2,000 listening to Billy Strings and Panic Live for free. Um, you know, frankly, I wish those bands would stream the shows for free on Nugsnet and not on Mixler. But, I, you know, typically what it is is a band member who's like who wants to do it and they just do it, even though, technically speaking, we we have exclusive distribution rights for the live recordings on a commercial basis. If the band wants to stream it free, I'm not gonna stop them, particularly in COVID and mid to post COVID times, you know, bands should be able to do whatever they want to reach their fans. So I'm not gonna get in the way of that. So while I would prefer that it happen in our ecosystem, even if it's free, I'm not gonna stop them from doing whatever they want. And you know, it's, it's their show, they can do what they want with it. Interesting. And Michelle Schacht says the devaluation of sync rights is next on the slave auction block. Thanks, deadheads. That may be un unrelated to our current discussion. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I mean, sync licensing is, I mean, that's, you were, David, you were asking earlier how we were able to do this. Um, fortunately, there's a congressionally established rate for mechanicals so it wasn't an issue to have fish take the stage new year's 2002 play whatever the hell they wanted and we were able to release it commercially because we knew we would not be denied a license for the mechanical the, the usage of the composition whether fish wrote it or not that's compulsory so, yeah so on the audio side we're good but in the video side it, it's still it is the wild west and there is no established rate and there's a you know there's a fair use i don't want to say it's fair use but it's um you know, it, it, ephemeral usage when it is live. So for example, when Fish takes the stage tonight, if they decide to open with a Velvet Underground cover, which would be lovely, uh, you know, we're, we're not gonna be, we don't have to stop the broadcast because they're playing something that wasn't pre-licensed. Now, if we release the video of that show after the fact, we would need to secure the sync license. And my point is there's no established rate for that sync license. That That's a real stumbling block. I remember the Grateful Dead had, uh, had to leave a Chuck Berry song off one of their concert videos because they hadn't gotten permission. Yep. Have we, we've had that problem with one of, the, uh, one of the first video releases we ever did for Fish commercially included a Good Times, Bad Times encore at the Garden. 
there was no way that the three living members of Led Zeppelin were going to sit down and grant us that license because that's actually what it takes. That the, they actually are convening to review these sync license offers, and you know they might do it for a Buick commercial, but they're not going to do it for uh, Fish at the Garden. <laughs> so, uh, so we had to leave that out. Um, I mean, more recently, we licensed a bunch of our videos to Coda, which is the new Amazon Prime service focused on concerts. Um, we had a Billy Strings show at Red Rocks. He had Rocky Raccoon opening, I think, the third set, and we had to cut that out because, you know, we weren't going to get a Beatles license for <laughs> So, yes, that still happens. But that answers the question a lot of fans ask me is, well, hey, you're broadcasting Fish live every night as a pay-per-view. You're broadcasting The Dead live every night as a pay-per-view. Why can't I watch those videos after the fact? The answer is because of the sync licenses. This is the same reason why uh, uh, all the music shows on radio are archived for two weeks only. You can't, you, and th there's the, the difference between on-demand streaming and, and um, push streaming or whatever you call it. I mean, there's a lot of legal distinctions that have to be dealt with through. In, yeah, in and the radio is very different from um, a direct-to-fan service, interactive streaming, non-interactive streaming, Pandora versus Sirius XM versus, you know, they're all, they're all related but different. Um, and and it, there, there's a there's a, a a group called Negative Land that uh, has done lots and lots of audio hacking over the years, and they had a radio show on KPFA called Over the Edge. They may still have it actually, and they could do anything they wanted with any audio over the radio. But when you try to put it onto a record and sell it, the law changes. I had a, a little audio montage. Uh, trapped on soundcloud because it had a little like a, a half a second of something from a commercial release and it flagged it and and deleted it and now i'm permanently banned from monetizing anything on soundcloud because i accidentally included this one little bit of yeah <laughs> so i yeah, screwed we, myself without even knowing it we have that problem and david you and i talked about this the other day so when when you and gary are going to be hosting the the halftime show with the dead every night we just have to be careful not to include any music in that because we're going to put that halftime show out on the band's YouTube and Facebook pages as a live stream. And we certainly don't want Dead & Company flagged as a copyright violation. No matter if we're doing our best efforts to use commercially authorized recordings, it's still the way those algorithms work on YouTube and Facebook. They are there to cover their asses based on the deals that they've put in place with the publishers and the record labels, which is a positive thing that they have that going. But it's frustrating when when you are the creator and you are authorized and you get flagged on your own channel. Uh, I, I, I'm as we have in this conversation, I realize that you are probably one of the most po most powerful people in the entire music industry right now. It'd be great if you told that to the managers I worked with. <laughs> <laughs> they don't see it that way. That, what, that's what, the, 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 one of the things I'm proudest of is the relationships that we've established with some of the most notoriously difficult managers in the world um and the fact that they keep inviting us back that's uh what i'm most proud of um but i think it's because you know we're obviously making the money in ways that they weren't able to before and um you know that we don't get in the way when we go out to do these streams for the show especially now during COVID times and you know it's one dude with a pelican case we're not coming in with a team of 15 people and a truck and, you know, having seven dudes on the side of the stage getting beers for their girlfriends. I mean, it's amazing the stuff that I've seen when we've done co-productions with some some of the major media services, um, whether it's a YouTube, a Pandora, whatever, you know, if they're doing a broadcast, the amount of people that they bring, because everybody wants a backstage pass and to come to a show, especially in the festival world, whereas we've been doing this for 20 plus years we show up with the, the bare bones minimum crew and just stay out of the way. And we only speak when spoken to. So I think that's, um, so that power dynamic, uh, you know, I'm, I serve the artist, the artist is my client and everything Nugsnet does. And what, what I try and instill in, in, in our employees is yes, we're, we're a consumer service and we're trying to serve the end user, the customer, the fan, but really first and foremost, we're serving the artist and we only exist because we're in the good graces of the artist. Um, and that, so that power that you're speaking of, the power lies with the artist. And we're very fortunate that for years, you know, we started at the top of the pyramid with Fish, then all the other jam bands, you know, kind of followed suit. Um, and then Metallica, 
it's not that we dominated the metal world because really no other band could do what Metallica's doing. But then you have Pearl Jam and Bruce and Jimmy Buffett and certainly it, it, it's it's the type of artist that's been a touring behemoth for years that wields that power. And we're just operating in the wake of that power. You know, it's, it's not like we have the power. The artist has the power. We're the, we're the plumbing that makes it happen on behalf of that artist. So if you're, if your guy on the dead and company tour is just showing up with a briefcase, who's, who's doing the video, who provides all that? Are they, are they using that in house and feeding your, your no, video? So all done when we're talking about a tour on that scale where they're pay- playing stadiums like you know wrigley field and, and city field uh they the dead carry their own video production the same way they carry their own you know ultrasound is doing the sound and um you know so in the case of the dead it's a company called filament that does the video in the case of fish it's a company called gateway that was born out of fish it was a, a bunch of guys who had been working for a larger video company called PRG that spun off and built their own video company. That company is now called Gateway and that's Fish's video vendor. Dead's video vendor is Filament, who's also, you know, Dave Matthews video. vendor. In fact, Filament came out of Dave Matthews world where Dave Matthews um, lighting director Fenton built this video company to capture Dave video every night starting in 2000. So that's how this is much the way Nugsnet grew out of the, the fan world. These companies sprung up to support the band's video needs. And so they are our part. It's the band's vendor. And we partner with them to do the broadcast. And so who control? So the, they install the video cameras and they control it and they switch the video to to be shown in inside the venue. They're You're doing both. Oh, they're, they're, they're cutting for the live broadcast, which is our feed. And they're cutting for the screens in the room. In the case of fish, they rarely have screens. Are there two separate people doing that? Um, sometimes, sometimes it's the same person. It kind of depends. Um, similar to the sound, you know, you have with the dead, you have, um, you know, Derek out front, and then there's another engineer backstage. Right. And the audio signal is split, so each guy has his own copy of the of everything to to mix. How does that work in the video side? Um, it really depends on the venue. Sometimes it's the exact same feed going to the screens and going to the live stream. But when you get into a massive place like Wrigley, it is a different, there's a slightly different cut going for the live broadcast first. Now, the good news is because of COVID and all the live streaming that happened over the last year and a half, the live stream is a real priority now. Whereas, you know, before the video in the room was more of the priority. Now the pay-per-view is, is, has become more, more, more important because of, you know, really because of COVID and there's going to be so many fans at home who aren't going to make it to the show that from the band's perspective, the live streaming experience is at least as important as the show itself. Of course, the show has to go on. And if a screen blows up in the venue, that's going to be the priority to fix that. But, um, you know, the, the, uh, when we started with Dead & Company, the live stream was like an add-on that we were doing to the show. Now the live stream is the show for everyone at home. And, you know, the, what's happening in the venue is of course important for the ticket buyers. And that show much, that, that takes a certain priority no matter what, because you've got 50,000 people in the room, but um, the lot that the edit of the live stream has become, I think more significant and more relevant to what the band's needs are and, and, and the fans. Whereas Fish, the difference there is fish was always about the live stream because fish doesn't carry screens. Unless they're like this week in Atlantic City, there's probably going to be screens there. But Fish was always doing the video just for archival purposes and solely for the pay-per-view because there is no video production in the room with Fish for the most part. That's a very expensive thing to do. I mean, obviously, but doing it for the live streams to get some revenue too, but they would have monetized it. it. It, They were doing it anyway, just for the sake of doing it. That's an expensive hobby. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, but it was the same with Dave Matthews. Dave Matthews, the brief filament, the company I talked about, started just to do that for Dave. And that was just to have it. They weren't doing, I mean, they put out some commercial releases, but, um, you know, we've only done three pay-per-views with Dave in, in 20 years. We've done a couple live, free live streams, but it's not like he's doing that as a live video business. He's doing it to do it, to have it in the can. Fascinating. Well, much like the dead did it to do it, you know, and had they had the wherewithal to do video every night, they would have, but well, it they, didn't, they it was did like, 
in the big venues when they when they wanted people in the on the lawn to be able to see what was going on on stage and stuff and they uh, again because it's the grateful dead they're really lucky somebody decided to actually roll tape on those feeds because they weren't thinking of that when they were doing it right right and, those and that's why what they the have way. is so, sorry yeah those are the shed video like the view from the vault series that's what was being captured in the shed regardless yes. And, whether and it was shoreline or whether it was you know walnut creek or whatever the you know deer creek or you know yeah and, uh, and you just got whatever was recorded off the feed in the same way that uh in many years uh the only thing that was being recorded in audio was a uh, just a monitor of the feed that was going to the pa so you right. couldn't recut it you couldn't get rid of the video uh of the electronic crap during the second set or whatever you just it was just a, basically like a sound the video equivalent of a soundboard tape yeah, but this is this is vast amounts of money being spent on this. I've just I guess I'm kind of surprised that they would have spent all that money to get video and, and not have monetized it from the start. But lucky for you, huh? Well, it was also the technology had to catch up with the business now, you know, in 2021. And it's a much different world from, you know, we started doing live video in 2010. We were barely able to get an SD as, you know, standard definition stream to the majority of people out there not that we couldn't get it out of the garden the garden certainly had ample bandwidth it's that last mile was still a problem in 2010. now in 2021 it's a lot less of a problem and more than half of u.s households have a 4k tv which is why we started doing 4k every night because you know on one hand we can charge almost twice the price for 4k our delivery costs are 16 times what it is to do hd wow. but it's, you know, it's again, it's that desire to put out the best possible quality. If you're going to do it, why not do it at the highest quality? So that's, you know, that's part of it. But also because the, the home, the market at home has caught up with what we're trying to do. And the last mile problem for the most part has been solved because everyone's got great high speed bandwidth, especially because of all the shit that happened during COVID and everyone's working from home. So people have dialed in their home <laughs> and like watching a live stream is now second nature to people. Whereas even you know, in 2019, it was still kind of a niche, goofy thing that, oh, that's a fish thing or a dead thing. Now it's everybody knows what a live stream is because of COVID. It's it, it, it is a whole different world, man. It's amazing how much things have changed. I, I was really lucky having spent so much time in radio. I, I was a little less intimidated by playing to an invisible audience than a lot of musicians who really, really wanted, you know, who would prefer to be in, playing live in front of people. Sitting at home in my studio is something I've already been doing for part of my living all these years. But right. watching everybody kind of pivot into thinking about it and and producing for for the small screen is kind of cool. I'm being attacked by my cat while we do this here. Well, and it's also a question of how many bands can sustain it. You know, I, I think Fish and the Dead, with the exception of maybe Pearl Jam or Bruce, Fish and the Dead are the only bands that i can think of off the top of my head that would have enough demand nightly to do a nightly pay-per-view it's uh you know because most bands are not mixing up their set or you know even metallica is mixed up for the most part eight out of 20 songs each night will change but there's still so much of the show that's the same even though metallica is one of the most popular bands in the history of live music i don't know how many nights they could do a pay-per-view you know and it's it's uh it's a tough balance because they're a massively popular band and the one pay-per-view we did with them was massively successful, but it's the only pay-per-view they've done in 38 years. So, you know, <laughs> it, it doesn't work. It only works when it works. And even if you look at the most popular artists out there, they played the same show every night. So how many, uh, and artists don't want to let that, let the cat out of the bag because the Cleveland show is the same as the Chicago show. I, I saw the Eagles on the long run tour uh, you know, I think it's 81 and yeah. at the open Coliseum and they played every song exactly, exactly to the note as it was on the records a couple of years later. Oh, I was so impressed by how they did that, how well they did that and how fresh they made it seem that I went back the next night and watched the identical show in the identical venue the same night, the second night in a row. And I noted that being a deadhead, of course, and um, uh, preferring that other thing of mixing it up from night to night. When I had a chance to interview Don Felder a couple of years later, I asked him about it and he said, well, you know, 
you pay 15 bucks to come to a show and you don't hear your, hear your favorite guitar lick on Hotel California, you're going to be disappointed. Well, yeah, isn't that, I think Glenn Fry said that is always jealous of Jerry that the dead could go out and take a dump on the stage and people would still love it. And, but that Jerry had the freedom to play whatever he wanted. Whereas if he didn't play that lick from Hotel California, exactly the same, people would feel gypped. That's a valid point. That it, it it's a valid point, but it also just points up the two the the two different approaches to doing these things. You know, you can perfect your music in the studio and then go out and recreate it, or you can do. I always feel like the Grateful Dead remained a bar band all the way up into the stadium level. That they 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 played self indulgently and in a fairly ramshackle way, even when they were playing to eighty thousand people in a in a stadium that's what made it special yes and as gary lambert has so often pointed out they also delivered you know 15 or 20 minutes of completely unstructured improvised music to these huge crowds you know and, and essentially kind of playing in one day to more people than coltrane played for in his entire life yeah with I mean, that, that weird ass abstract music i mean what a miracle it is that we got to live through all this yeah, and it, you know, in a, in a similar but different way, the E Street Band is the world's greatest bar band. They are that bar band, and still are to this day. They just happen to be playing in front of ninety thousand people in a soccer stadium in Europe somewhere. But it's that bar band mentality, just played loud, and you know, Bruce will call audibles and try and stump the band by pulling out some song they hadn't played in thirty years, if ever. And in just in he, between, perfected renditions of the classics. I mean, they, yeah. in a way, I mean, they, I, I had a friend who went and saw Springsteen on tour down in Australia many, many years ago and remarked on the fact that Bruce had all these moves, like worked out, you know, that at this given moment in this song, he'd wind up on his knees playing his guitar in front of the, you know, that a lot of this stuff was completely choreographed down to the subframe like modern shows are. And... He blow it up with the audibles and stuff like that. So in a way, Bruce is kind yeah. of the best of both, right? Yeah, and I, I I would put Pearl Jam in the same camp, where you know there's certain songs Pearl Jam has to play, but there's enough spontaneity there, and they're they're not playing it exactly like the album, but there's certain riffs that McCready has to hit, otherwise you know fans will flip out. But they have a, there's enough spontaneity there, and certainly a huge amount of variety in their shows. But not not many bands at that level playing stadiums around the world can support that kind of uh, business but those that can do that those are our, our clients and i you know it's not to say that we can't expand into other genres but you know maybe in the edm world there's spontaneity there but there's also not spontaneity there because a lot of it's canned and and pre-licensed and pre-authorized you know so it's hard you know how many bands are like the grateful dead I, I wanna, we, we are about to run out of time unfortunately um, I wanted to ask you one thing. One of the big bugaboos for musicians is how incredibly fucked up the compensation system is from these streaming services. I regard Spotify as a, a mild annoyance at best. I'm there, but I don't make any money from it. I don't make any money from online stuff. My Amazon cut is like four cents a year and shit like that. How, do your, does your NugsNet subscription model compensate the artists reasonably? Well, just to do if you to do apples apples, which is hard to do because we're you know we're not all things to all people, um, we're not all the recorded works of mankind. We're twenty five thousand exclusive live audio recordings, uh, so we are paying. If you're just comparing the rates, we're paying about three times the Spotify rate on a per play basis, a little more than double the Apple rate, and fifteen times the YouTube rate. So yeah, yes, cool. we're compensating much more generously, but we're a way smaller market. Of course, we're not, you know, we're, we're virtually non-existent compared to the reach of YouTube and Spotify. Uh, so, but for our artists, it is significant, you know, like take Billy Strings, you know, he's a, a guy who, I don't want to say he came out of nowhere, but he is somewhat meteoric, meteoric rise in the last did, year. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, he's really does well on our streaming service because we, you know, he gets, he gets paid. But the thing we joke about internally, he also is playing a lot of three minute songs. So because we pay per play, the amount of plays that Billy Strings generates will far exceed, say, Dead and Company, because Dead and Company will play Dark Star for 23 minutes, whereas <laughs> that's like seven Billy Strings songs. But yeah, Billy will stretch out too. But for the most part, he's jamming in 22 to 25 songs in the show because it's mostly Tradgrass, 
you know, with some extended jams, uh, but he's also an incredible musician. So it balances out. Um, but we do pay a significantly, significantly higher rate on a per play basis. And then on our a la carte stuff, like a pay-per-view it, you know, we're, we're on par with the other major services in terms of how we compensate the artists, but we're also bringing so much to the table by having this audience with a rabid appetite for live music. So there's a halo effect, whether it's the dead or Bruce or Pearl Jam or David Gaines, you know, it's like you're, you're in the pool of like-minded fans who want to hear live music. And I, and I also, I, I'm also an artist who doesn't take any of this shit personally. I recognize that I'm a very, very small fish in this thing. And I, I'm happy, you know, to take advantage of what these things can do. And, and I don't feel like it's a grave injustice, you know, it's just interesting to watch uh, the music business was constituted from the beginning to deny payment to artists. So we're slowly coming into a thing where artists have more control. In fact, I feel like the playing field is leveled in such a way that um, the possibilities for a guy like me are fairly limited, but then I'm able to carve out a niche for myself and and do okay, do acceptably well under these circumstances. So I feel like I'm doing okay in the middle of all this. It's just fascinating to watch it and to observe how incredibly massive the changes have been over the course of the last couple of decades. We're, we're out of time, Tom? Sadly, we're getting there. I would love to pose a couple of questions that I fielded from the Zoom, if you will allow me, David. I, I'm in no um, hurry. First off, in, in my prep for this, you tipped me on one of Brad's early uh, projects, Metallica from the North Pole. I got to hear about that one. Yeah. Well, who in the hell has broadcast <laughs> anything from the North Pole, Brad, please? Uh, what was crazy is that we had, uh, we built a road box that had eight, pot, we called them POTS lines, plain old tele telephone service. So eight phone lines multiplexed together to give the equivalent of around 256 kilobits of broadcast. We actually used uh, CUC Me, which was funny because I had gone to Cornell undergrad. CUC Me was like, what we're doing now over Zoom is what CUC Me was in the, in the early 90s. Except it was black and white and it was like five frames a second. So we actually broadcast Metallica Live from Tuktiuktuk, which was the closest inhabited village to the magnetic North Pole on the Beaufort Sea. And the event was the most nice polar beach party. So my client, ironically, wasn't Metallica. My client was most nice because um, I had done, right around that time, I had done Budweiser.com for Anheuser-Busch. I don't know how we were able to work for Molson at the same time, but we were. So we did uh, um, the Molson Ice Polar Beach Party where 200 fans won a trip to the North Pole by you know popping the bottle cap and, and winning a prize. So it was 200 fans, me and a crew of like five people and Metallica in Tuktiuktuk. I was there for a week. The band flew in and out the same day. Fans flew in and out the same day. And we broadcast it live. I mean, it was like, I, I don't remember how many people watched it, but it was just one of those things we did to do it. And it was ironic that Metallica was my first big client after Fish, once Nugsnet went pro. Um, that, wasn't, that wasn't in any way related, but I certainly remind the band of that every time we do a live stream that, you know, hey, remember that time we, we broadcast yeah. live from the North Pole? Um, so that, that's how that came together. Amazing. And it, Beautiful. Tom, you want to ask that last question from Stu? Uh, go ahead, please. Uh, if Stu Levitan was wondering about the 48 hour window rewatching a PPV. That's that's related to the sync license question. Yeah, that's falls under fair use like DVR usage. So basically we're granting DVR usage unless for some reason a band or a publisher or a label says no. When you buy, so for example, Fish will take the stage tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern, or maybe it's 7.30, whatever the time is. You can go to livefish.com. You can buy the pay-per-view for 25 bucks. That 25 bucks is granting you the rights to watch it live while the band is on stage. And then you'll have 48 hours to watch it again. Or if you missed it, you know, you could start it over uh, for 48 hours. That's how that works. And that- Can you watch it more than once for your money? Technically you could, yeah. I mean, it's, we're not limiting the number of, it's, it's a clock that starts from the minute you hit play. And that is because of sync licenses. That's why it's limited to that, but it, we do let you use it on multiple devices. It is locked to your one account. So like if David, if you bought it and you're watching, if Tom logs in with your account, it's going to stop the broadcast for you. So there is, 
we're restricting the usage to make sure we're complying with the, the rights that were granted. Exactly why I never give Tom my password. Yeah, which is generally <laughs> a good rule. Don't give Tom your passwords. <laughs> yeah, everyone listen to that. That's a true statement. <laughs> um, yeah. Gentlemen, uh, I just I just want to say thank you for all the work that you've done to make the music industry better for fans like me. As I said at the top of the show, you are two of my heroes from parts of the music business that I am frankly very emotionally attached to, the Grateful Dead and to Fish. And so Brad, I tip my hat to you for figuring out a way to turn your hobby into a multinational, huge, great company, not only for, for you and your shareholders, but for the fans. So thank you and please keep doing it. My pleasure, thanks. David, <laughs> keep doing what you're doing, my brother. Um, <laughs> 450 shows and counting, keep going, but then also just keep delivering the great Grateful Dead content that you do every day and every week for all the fans so out there. I am, I am the one of the luckiest people you're ever going to know, man. I have managed to do music-related things for a living for upwards of 50 years. And the Grateful Dead, I seriously, the Grateful Dead have essentially subsidized my career by allowing me to work with their music. I mean, I, you know, I, I was a licensee and all that stuff. Uh, for for many years, but I it really not only by inspiring me and by helping me to become the kind of musician that I am in their partially in their image, but also by literally fostering my own work by allowing me to uh, to uh, curate theirs for so long, and I could hardly be more grateful. And I want to quickly mention everybody that I play that live stream every day on facebook.com slash music at four o'clock California time today and every day through Sunday. And it's also available on a platform called cashortrade.org, which is a free uh, ticket swap site. Uh, and I, I just do it every day and it's keeping me sane and happy. And I thank all of you in advance for coming to check it out. And starting Monday, sorry, oh, and Monday I'm skipping my show because I got to do this thing for Brad instead. <laughs> yeah, so this this band called Dead and Company is starting their tour on Monday, and David and Gary Lambert will be hosting the halftime show every night. So every night's a pay per view, and then at set break we're going to cut to David and Gary, and they're going to sit in a Zoom room like this and talk about the show and talk to fans and have special guests. Uh, so that'll be part of the pay-per-view broadcast, but it'll also be that set break piece will be broadcast free on the band's socials, Facebook and YouTube and on nugs.net. Wonderful. And this thing here will be archived, right, Tom? Yeah, I'll have this up on YouTube later tonight. So anyone who missed it or uh, want to share it, share it with their friends, please do so. Wonderful. Um, with that, folks, I'm going to sign us off. Again, thank you, gentlemen, for all your great work and please keep doing it. Please keep healthy to the audience. Get a freaking shot as soon as you can so we can keep yes. seeing this great live music that these yes. guys are helping produce. Thank and you, everybody. That. See you later, folks. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, David. Cheers. Thank you, Brad. Enjoy your vacation. Thanks. <laughs>